Let us discuss the lead derivative of a vector, or more precisely, the lead derivative of a vector field, let's call it y, as it moves along another vector field, x. So the lead derivative serves to capture the change of a vector, in our case we called it y, as it moves along another vector, x. And by putting this into precise mathematical terms, we're going to get a better understanding of the lead derivative and we're going to derive a mathematical expression. So we start with a differentiable manifold and let's call this M. And actually it's sufficient for us to work within a single chart in that manifold. So we have an open set U and then we have a map phi that maps points in this open set U to points in m-dimensional real space, where m is just the dimension of the manifold. Now on that manifold we have a vector field x. So let me draw some little arrows here. I'm not just drawing them directly on the manifold, but remember that these vectors actually live in tangent spaces to the manifold at the respective point. And whenever we have a vector field on a manifold like this, we can draw curves. We can draw curves like this. And we can draw a curve like this, with the property that this vector field x is always tangent to these curves. And we've introduced the concept of an integral curve here. So an integral curve is a curve on a manifold, that is, we get a point on the manifold for each value of some real parameter t, that's just an element of the real numbers, or a subset of the real numbers, that's not too important here, such that we can write this integral curve with the lowercase x, either as a point on the manifold or as the coordinates of that point on the manifold. So if I put an index here, what I mean is not the point, but rather its coordinates. Since we're always working within the open set u, and we have a unique function phi that gives us coordinates to each point in u, and can also be used to map these coordinates back to points on u, we can kind of use points on the manifold and their coordinates interchangeably. And now we differentiate this curve with respect to its curve parameter t, and what we get is nothing but the vector field capital X evaluated at X of T. So this is just a mathematical expression for the fact that the vector field capital X is tangent to the integral curve at every point. Now there are actually an infinite number of such integral curves. I just uh, drew two of them, but of course there are many more and they don't intersect or overlap. So each integral curve is determined by giving one point that lies on the curve, and that's going to uniquely determine the whole integral curve. Now we can make this a little more precise by introducing what's called the flow of the vector field x. That's again a map that we call sigma, this time of two parameters. So we have a real parameter t, just like before, and then we have a point x naught on the manifold, or rather on our open set, let's say. And this is going to give us the point that we arrive at if we start at x0 and then follow the integral curve through x0 for the distance of t. So let's draw this. We have an integral curve to the vector field capital X and the point x0 is on that integral curve. Then we start at x0 and we just follow along for distance t until we arrive at another point and that's the point sigma of t and x0. Now as should be clear sigma of 0 x0 is just x0 because if we don't move at all from the point x0 which is going to stay there and we can also uh, differentiate this map sigma with respect to t And again, now I'm introducing a mu, so now I'm looking at the coordinates of the point that sigma maps to instead of just the point on the manifold in an abstract sense. But we're just going to move around between these descriptions. So technically you would have to apply the function phi to get to the coordinates. 
And this is again nothing but the vector x mu, the vector field x mu, evaluated at sigma of t and x naught. Because what sigma does is nothing but single out a specific integral curve and parameterize that integral curve with the parameter t. You're just picking out the integral curve that goes through the point x naught. So you're essentially providing an initial condition for this equation here, which then gives you a unique integral curve. This is the flow of the vector field capital X. The leader derivative attempts to capture the change of another vector field as it moves along the flow of the vector field X. And derivatives are usually concerned with the rate of change of objects, but they're usually considering that change over an infinitesimal distance. So let us now just draw the same picture again. Start at a point x0 that lies on an integral curve to the vector field x. And then instead of moving for a distance t, let's just move for an infinitesimal distance epsilon until we arrive at the point. It's called q, but it's of course nothing but sigma of epsilon and x0. And now suppose we have a vector field y that we can of course evaluate at the point x0. And we can of course move this vector field along and evaluate y at the point q. Now the lead derivative asks the question how much did this vector field change while moving along this integral curve for the distance epsilon? And that's a very interesting question that at this point we cannot answer because the vectors y of q and y of x0 live in different tangent spaces. They are defined on different points on the manifold, so therefore they belong to tangent spaces at different points, and these are just different spaces that we can't really compare to each other. The only way for us to make sense of this is if there were a way of moving this vector y back to the point x0 in a meaningful way, let's call this new vector y tilde, so that we can now compare y tilde with y of x0, because they both live on the same point x0. So what we need to find is a meaningful way of relating tangent spaces at different points of our manifold. And there's actually a clever way to do this, and it's called the induced map, or the push forward. It's a little more general than what we need right here, but I still want to introduce it in its full generality, because it's a very powerful concept. So suppose that we now have two different manifolds. We have a manifold M and we have a different manifold N, and they don't even need to have the same dimension. Now suppose there's a map F that maps from the manifold M to the manifold N. So if we have, for instance, a point here on M, and let's call it Q, this point gets mapped to a point F of Q in the manifold N. Now we can introduce tangent spaces on these manifolds. So with this rectangle, I'm suggesting the tangent space at the point Q to the manifold M, so it's written as TQM. And here we can have the tangent space at the point F of Q to the manifold N. And now we can consider vectors that live in these tangent spaces. So let's introduce a vector that lives in TQM and let's call it V. And we now want to assign another vector in the tangent space tfqn to the vector v. And there's actually a meaningful way to do this that's induced by the function f. So that's why it's called the induced map. Let's draw it in here. And it's usually called f star with a subscript star. And this map f star maps the vector v to another vector f star v. And how does it do that? Well, there's a certain relation that needs to be fulfilled, and it goes as follows. So the newly constructed vector f star v is an element of a tangent space to the manifold n. And recall that vectors are nothing but differential operators acting on smooth scalar functions on our manifold. I assume that everything is smooth here, so f is uh, just a smooth function between those manifolds. And f star of v can now act 
on a smooth function that's defined on a manifold n and maps points on m to the scalars. So let's introduce such a function and call it g. So g maps points of n to real numbers. And f star of v as a vector in a tangent space to n can act on such functions. And for any function g, for any conceivable smooth function g, this result needs to be equivalent to what we get when we act with v. Now v is an element of a tangent space to the manifold m, so it needs to act on scalar functions defined on m. And unfortunately we can construct such a function just by functional composition by taking g uh, composed with f. Together these two are a scalar function that maps points on the manifold m to real numbers. So let me uh, convince you that this is true. So the function f takes a point on the manifold m and puts out a point on the manifold n. That point on the manifold n can then be put into the function g to get a real number. So together they do nothing but map the manifold m to the real numbers. So that's g composed with f. And this is also sometimes written as f and then a superscript star g and it's then called the pullback of g by f. So let me write this down. It's just a name but it's a frequently occurring name. Because what this does is it takes the function g that usually maps from n to r and it pulls it back using f to the manifold m so that it now maps from m to r. And actually this f uh, subscript star v is called the push forward. By the same logic it's just a map that uh, maps the tangent space tqm to tf of qn and it's induced by the map f and it goes along the direction of f. It goes from m to n in the same direction as f so this is why it's called the push forward while the pull back goes into the opposite direction of f. It pulls something from n to m which is opposite of the direction of the map f. And this relating tangent spaces to each other is actually exactly what we need. But our case is even more simple because we don't need to relate tangent spaces to different manifolds. We just need to relate tangent spaces of the same manifold to each other. So in our case m equals n. Then let's find out what the map f is. The map f in our case needs to relate the points at which we want to compare tangent spaces to each other and more precisely it needs to map the point q back to the point x0. And remember that q was nothing but sigma of epsilon and x0. And the map that accomplishes that is if we simply take the flow again, the sigma, then put in minus epsilon as the parameter and map the point x to the point that you get if you move the distance minus epsilon along the integral curve. And so if we just redo our drawing real quick, so with x0, and we move the distance epsilon, we arrive at q, and now we move the distance epsilon back again, we arrive at x0 again. So this is now a map from points on m two points on m, it's a smooth map, it's a diffeomorphism. It's actually a one parameter group of diffeomorphisms because you can put in different parameters here, but we just fixed that to minus epsilon and it's gonna stay that way for now. Now let's just translate v and f star v in the language that we used before. So if I scroll up to what we had here, we had the vector y, so that's now the vector v and we move that over using the map f star to the vector y tilde, so that's what it was called f star v before. With these identifications we can now write this relation once more. So f star v is now y tilde and let us introduce components of the vector and basis elements. And the basis elements are of course differential operators because the vectors are differential operators acting on scalar functions. And the scalar function in this case is g of x and then we need to evaluate this at x equals x naught because that's where the vector y tilde acts 
the vector y tilde only exists at x0. You can actually draw it in here, a vector y of x0. Then we had a vector y of q that was moved along the integral curve. And then we move back using f star, using the push forward to a vector y tilde. And the vector y tilde is defined at x0, so it needs to be evaluated at x0. There's no way around that. And this is equal to y mu at the point q, d mu acting at g. Now we perform the functional composition of sigma minus epsilon x. And this time we evaluate at x equals q, because yq is obviously defined at the point q. Now, since this holds for any function g, we can pick out what's convenient to us. And convenient is the choice g of x equals x nu. So the function g just takes its argument and returns the new uh, coordinate of that argument. And that's convenient because it makes this expression equal to d mu x nu, which is nothing but delta mu nu. So the left hand side just becomes y tilde nu. And we can forget about this evaluation at x0 because there's no x dependency anymore. Now the right hand side, we write y mu of q d mu. And then evaluating g gives us the new coordinate of the point sigma minus epsilon and x. And here we have to write the evaluation because we have to put in q for x once we are done. Now differentiating sigma with respect to x or x mu is not something that we've done before. And the trick here is to actually start by doing a Taylor expansion of this sigma nu in epsilon. So simply put sigma nu of zero x plus d dt sigma nu of t and x evaluated at t equals zero times minus epsilon and then we get terms of order epsilon squared and higher let me just cross out the terms of epsilon squared and higher order and we're going to justify this in a second but this is nothing but a taylor expansion of sigma nu around epsilon equals zero and since epsilon is small this is well justified and again we're going to see why we can scratch the epsilon squared terms. So let's further simplify this. So this is actually just x nu plus and uh, differentiating with respect to the curve parameter gives the tangent vector. We saw that before. Then we evaluate at t equals zero, which just gives us the point x again. And then we have the minus epsilon. Now let us perform the differentiation d mu on this. Is d mu acting on this, and this gives us delta mu nu plus d mu x nu. And then let's actually put uh, q for x. So just remember that we first have to uh, perform the derivative and then we can put x equal to q. And let me actually put the minus here and the epsilon here. Okay, and let's now put this together. So we get y tilde nu is equal to y mu evaluated at q. And then the expression that we just derived, which is delta mu nu minus d mu x nu evaluated at q times epsilon. And that's an explicit expression for y tilde, or for the components of y tilde rather, which is very, very close to what we need. But there's still a slight problem with this expression. And that's the fact that this expression is given in terms of quantities evaluated at the point q here and here. And if I scroll up a little to our drawing, we see, of course, that y tilde is defined at x0. And what we want is we want to perform this whole lead derivative at the point x0. We don't want to go to any other point and evaluate quantities there. And there's actually a very simple way to do this. Remembering again, that q was nothing but a short way of writing sigma of epsilon 
x0. And we can again tailor expand this expression. Now let us again introduce explicit coordinates. So let's write sigma alpha of epsilon x0. And this is nothing but x0 plus epsilon capital X alpha evaluated at x0 plus uh, terms of higher order epsilon squared and above that we again choose to ignore. And of course we should put an alpha here because we're now giving coordinates for the points. We can use this to perform uh, even more Taylor expansions of our quantities y and x as follows. So we, here we have y mu of q is now y mu of x naught alpha plus epsilon capital X alpha evaluated at x naught. And we can now Taylor expand this around x naught to get y mu of x naught plus epsilon times d alpha of y mu evaluated at x naught times x alpha evaluated at x naught. And we do a similar thing with this x nu here. So this x nu of x naught alpha plus epsilon capital X alpha of x naught. But it's even simpler in this case. So this is x nu evaluated at x naught plus epsilon times something. But this term already is of order epsilon squared because there's an additional epsilon appearing here that multiplies this whole thing. So we can just stop here and just replace x nu evaluated at q with x nu evaluated at x naught. And of course, we only evaluate after we perform this derivative right here. So this needs to act on x nu first, and then we evaluate at that specific point. And now we're actually done. So we can just put together everything that we have to get an expression for component nu of y tilde is equal to, and we insert y mu of x naught plus epsilon d alpha y mu evaluated at x naught x alpha evaluated at x naught and this times delta nu mu minus d mu x nu evaluated at x naught times epsilon. The only thing that's left to do is to multiply out this expression. So first term with the first term just gives y nu of x naught. Then the second term with the first term gives plus epsilon. And I'm just rearranging a little. So I'm putting x alpha of x naught to the front. Then we have d alpha and the index mu gets replaced by the index nu evaluated at x naught. Then we have the first term with the second term on the right, which gives minus epsilon y mu of x naught d mu x nu of x naught. And then the second term with the second term would again give an epsilon squared contribution that we choose to leave out. And we finally have an expression for y tilde in terms of quantities that depend on x naught here here, 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 and here. So all that's left to do now is to compute the difference of y tilde to y at x naught, and we know how much the vector changed through all of this. And that's exactly how the Lie derivative is defined. So we write this curly L to indicate the Lie derivative. Then as a subscript, we write the vector along which uh, we perform the Lie derivative and then we write the vector of which we would like to know the Lie derivative. Then I maybe should add x0 here because that's a point at which we in our derivation evaluated the Lie derivative and it's nothing but, so this is actually the definition of it, the limit epsilon goes to zero y tilde minus y at x0 over epsilon. And now you can see why we chose to ignore epsilon squared and higher order terms. Because for all epsilon squared and higher order terms there will be an epsilon left and if we take the limit these terms won't contribute at all. 
Now we can easily go to components here within our coordinate system. And then we can evaluate this expression. So we take y tilde and the first term already gets subtracted away. Then we divide the rest by epsilon, which removes these epsilons. And what we're left with is nothing but x alpha of x naught d alpha y nu of x naught minus y mu x naught d mu x nu x naught. And of course, we must not forget about the basis vectors d nu. Uh, so the result of this computation is again a vector, a differential operator. Now the point x0 appears here because that's the point that we chose to evaluate the Lie derivative at. But you can choose any point. So we could just replace that by generic x or just not write it at all, which is what people usually do. So just write lx of y equals and let's just replace the dummy index alpha by mu to make it look a little nicer. So we have x mu d mu y nu minus y mu d mu x nu. And of course, don't forget about the basis vector, the differential operator. And you might realize that within our coordinate system, this expression is nothing but the commutator of the vector field x and y, which is why this is also sometimes given as definition of the Lie derivative of a vector along another vector. And the nice thing about this is it's just the commutator of vectors at some specific point, and as such it gives back a vector at that specific point, which is a tensorial quantity. So the last expression I wrote is actually completely independent of basis, which is why this is a particularly nice way of uh, writing the Lie derivative. Okay, so I think that's enough for now, and next time we're going to look at some more properties of the Lie derivative and how we can extend it to general tensorial quantities. So not just perform the Lie derivative of vectors, vector fields, but rather of uh, general tensors of arbitrary rank. And see you then.